Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experience in Kentucky Bourbon. And today, we're going to talk about high malt bourbon, hiding whiskey in a coffin, and how to motivate whiskey drinkers to get laws changed. You can hear those conversations and more with my guest, Tim Pearsant, who's the CEO and founder of Chattanooga Whiskey. And if you're new to this concept of high malt or high rye or weeded bourbons, we're still basically talking about a 51% corn mash bill. But in the case of Chattanooga, their malted barley is the predominant secondary grain. So we're going to go through a little bit of the distillery's history and find out more about how Tim and his head distiller, Grant McCracken, ended up basing the company's flagship whiskey around malted barley. We'll also get into the challenges Tim faced in starting a distillery. We'll talk about some of the risky bridges he chose to burn along the way. And Tim is going to share his brand new release, which is the fall 2017 edition of Chattanooga Whiskey's Bottled in Bond Vintage Series. Now, in Chattanooga, there's actually two different distilleries that are both run by Chattanooga Whiskey. And the first is the one that you can visit downtown, which is the Experimental Distillery. And if you haven't been, it's a great tour. It's one where you can see their pot still in action. You can hear the stories of Chattanooga Whiskey history. And you can visit their Dunnage warehouse underneath the building where all of their experiments are resting. But for this interview, we're actually at the other distillery, the Riverfront Distillery, which is unfortunately closed to the public. But that's where they do all of their full-scale production. And Tim had just given me a guided tour, and then we sat down in their conference room and... Why don't we just get into this? A great conversation with Tim. He's a lot of fun to chat with. He's had some fascinating experience. So let's get things rolling with my interview with Tim Pearsant of Chattanooga Whiskey. So Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Drew. Well, Chattanooga. I knew very little about Chattanooga until your whiskey. It's fun to say, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It is. Uh, I knew because of my dad. Yeah. I knew a Glenn Miller song, Chattanooga Choo Choo. <laughs> yeah, kind of popular. Yeah. Uh, so that's always, the, I drive through, I see the signs, and that's the first thing that kind of pops into my head. I'd say probably you and most. <laughs> yeah, of course, I'm sure uh, less and less as everyone gets older. That's right? true. Yeah. Yeah, so I have been down to your uh, experimental distillery, which we'll talk a little bit about. Cool. And, of course, the train is right across the street on the other side. It so is. yeah fun to wander down through there. It's a, it's a great spot. Yeah. So with Chattanooga and realizing that the Tennessee River rolls right through here, it would seem to make sense that there were a lot of distilleries yep. here before Prohibition. But did you know there were any distilleries here pre-Prohibition? Not until 2011. Yeah. I mean, that was when uh, Joe and I discovered it. Um, but... After we discovered it, it made sense to me too, you know, the, because of the landscape and just a beautiful part of the country and the natural resources that are available to uh, to anyone that wants to make whiskey or distill. So, um, yeah, did not discover that until 2011, and I'm born and raised in Chattanooga. So, yeah. uh, born in '81, uh, left for college and came back, and um, and then worked for my dad for a little bit, and then. I guess seven years after spending a career with my dad, I started Chattanooga Whiskey alongside Joe. Wow. So, yeah. so were, were you a whiskey drinker before? I would say that I was not. I mean, when I think of a whiskey drinker, um, I guess that has evolved, what yeah. a whiskey drinker is over, over the last couple of decades. So uh, did I, you know, did I have a, you know, a Jack and Coke regularly or, you know, I mean, could I have, could, did I have whiskey yeah. whether it was mixed or not i mean yes i would but did i actually appreciate it for what it was and i would say no i didn't um prior to starting chattanooga whiskey and so so what was it that drew you into the idea of starting a whiskey brand and then distillery 
Yeah, it was the history, and uh, and my co-founder was more into whiskey at that time than I was, and kind of teaching me about it a little bit. And um, so we'd have a glass of Blands together, and you know, and talk about it. And we, but that was right when we discovered the history. It was uh, it was really exciting that no one had done anything with it. Yeah, <laughs> we, shocking, really. Yeah, and. Um, seven years into working with my dad, who I love and respect very much, it just wasn't going to be my long-term career. And I was living downtown. My wife and I were very much a part of the kind of the beginning of the revitalization of downtown and specifically the historic Southside district, which is where the experimental distillery mm-hmm. sits. Mm-hmm. So an opportunity to, uh, to bring whiskey back to Chattanooga for the first time in a hundred years, pretty exciting. Yeah. And when uh, when we announced it, we had no product and we had no plans, and uh, but it was this really exciting thought, and we really owned that you know we were Chattanooga whiskey when we announced it on Facebook that we were bringing it back, uh, and and it uh, got a lot of the community really excited, and there were there was a, a big response, um, and and it just I would say that was the beginning of the snowball effect, where. It just, our guts told us that this was, you know, this, this was meant to be uh, restored and it could be something really big. And we, every day brought us something new. And that, you know, when I was at the time 30 years old and uh, my wife, uh, you know, we were pregnant with our first child and we actually technically had, we had our first daughter within a week of or a couple of weeks of starting Chattanooga whiskey. And, uh, and so I was just very energized and it just, and it just kind of steamrolled from there. So did you have a, a business plan in place when you made the announcement or were you kind of, uh, nothing, jump, jump in the, nothing. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> in fact, I was playing music with our, with our creative director who uh-huh. was, who was our first, higher and is still our creative director you know a a decade later and i remember after joe and i discovering this and talking about it and saying let's do it i told them about this idea and they were like oh man that you know that sounds pretty cool but you know everybody's always skeptical skeptical of anyone wanting to start a business yeah Specifically, bringing something back after a hundred years and not knowing anything about whiskey, and then, you know, that the the uh, the next day, they saw that we had just posted it, posted it, yeah. and they were like, "What are you doing?" They were really, <laughs> really, they thought we were idiots for actually <laughs> just posting it with no plan to do anything about it. And uh, I don't know, it's definitely become kind of a, a fun part of our history, a part of our history that we don't talk about very much. Yeah, but at but, that time, during that landscape, you really, um, it, it was still not open throughout Tennessee to be able to do distilling. So that's correct, yeah. how soon after that did you go, oh crap, what have we done? And is there ever gonna be a chance for us to actually come through with this yeah i don't really recall exactly the the time uh the timeline of my of our of our realizations on that i definitely remember not knowing the depth of the laws around distilling in tennessee when we started chattanooga whiskey we kind of found out i want to say maybe we didn't even know about it even before we posted it we posted and then we started uh learning that it was illegal but even the even as we learned it was illegal, those laws were very unclear, mm-hmm. and so it launched us into while we were, you know, it launched us into a lot of research on the laws while we were, you know, putting the pieces together to be able to sell Chattanooga whiskey, which meant that it had to come from out of town. Yeah, and. And, and so the networking began and therefore the lobbying began and, uh, and then that, that was really one foot in front of the other, uh, eventually realized that it was pretty, it was, it was going to be complex because of the lack of information around it. Uh, Really no one, it was, I mean, it dated back to prohibition. Like nobody really knew why, um, until we kind of 
So we were lobbying locally, and then eventually, um, you know, as we were met with headwind, uh, and the and the county didn't want this blood on their hands. They mm. really thought that this was going to create a massive issue. Yeah. For uh, the you know the this, the community. They didn't want to be the guys that said, yeah, we're going to let a couple of 30-year-olds bring whiskey distilling back to Chattanooga for the first time in 100 years. Yeah. They didn't want that liability, though they were willing to vote on uh, allowing it if the state approved it. Okay. And so... So put it on somebody else's back, They put back, it basically. on the state, and then, yeah. you know, at that point, it just became a bigger... It became a state issue. And at that point we got in touch with uh, Joe Carr, who wrote the bills for um, the 2009 law change, mm -hmm. of which uh, many counties uh, ex you know, were adopted, or adopted that yeah. law, but... This, this was putting it in the hands of the actual counties to be able to that's right. opt in or opt out. In 09, yes. And that is why it wasn't the majority of the 95 counties in Tennessee that opted in in 09. And that's why our law was so much more challenging. Because you had a county that didn't really want to take that forward. So, so not, not just that, yeah. but we had a county representative that fought it in 09 probably oh. harder than anyone. Wow. And he was still in the Tennessee legislature. So what's interesting is I've done some research on Tennessee's pre-prohibition uh, evolution, and Tennessee's always been battling temperance. But the last strongholds were the cities. So Chattanooga was one of the last to give up the ability to make whiskey. They fought it. I even heard a story about whether it was an undertaker or somebody was uh, storing whiskey in, a, in yeah, a coffin. That's right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah the police commissioner. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, yeah, fun <laughs> stories like that. So, yeah. you know, it was Knoxville, it was Chattanooga, it was Nashville, it was Memphis that, that tried to hold out as long as they possibly could. And to see now that that history has been forgotten and that one of these strongholds is now scared to jump back in it had, had to be a little frustrating yeah well it wasn't frustrating there were there were moments that were that were frustrating because it felt like this might be the end mm -hmm. of us and chattanooga whiskey right and, and and we would receive some news uh here and there that that felt like you know, just a, another wall, another brick wall, another hurdle. But it was still exciting. And it was still, um, the, the fight mm -hmm. was, was uh, invigorating. It's sort of, it's like when somebody gives you something and then you kind of take it for granted. But when you have to go after it yourself, there's a little extra pride in it for... You know, where we were in our careers and in our families... It was just it was just the right time uh, for us to be talking about it and doing something about it all hours of the day and all hours of the night. I mean, we would talk about we would you know be brainstorming till two three a.m. in the morning. And it was just being entrepreneurs. Yeah. But um, in an illegal industry for the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was uh, <laughs> and and we were and we were getting a lot of attention from the community around it. Yeah. Which helped only inspire us and motivate us more to do it you know i mean if if we were having to do all of this i mean we did a lot of you know underground research and whatnot but i mean if we were having to do all of this um with without the community's interest yeah uh, it probably uh, you know it probably wouldn't have gone forward so so which came first then was there a point while you were waiting for the vote uh that you were able to start bringing in sourced mm -hmm. whiskey. Yeah, no, definitely sourcing the whiskey came first. Okay. As we were, um, as at the beginning, at the very beginning, our interest was, what could Chattanooga whiskey be? Let's get started now. Yeah. Uh, it wasn't like, hey, we didn't have any funding. And we didn't have the, um, the, the personal uh, finances to be able to build a distillery. So we had to, we didn't have a choice. We had to source. So we, as we were looking around, it was really about 
how do we want to tell the story? What kind of whiskey should it be? What should the label look like? Mm -hmm. uh, so we got a local you know, graphic designer involved and uh, we looked at lots of pre-prohibition labels mm -hmm. and we were inspired by those pre-prohibition labels. Uh, we liked bourbon. We liked bourbon more than Tennessee whiskey. So we wanted it to be, in fact, I, I guess, uh, I don't even know if t there was a Tennessee whiskey resource at the time uh, for outsourcing, but um, but regardless of the few bourbons that were available, when we got the samples in uh, from MGP, yeah, it wasn't actually the it wasn't MGP. It was Lawrenceburg Distillers of Indiana. Okay, which got acquired which, by yes, MGP. we got acquired by MGP. Yeah. But when we got the samples from LDI, we were blown away. We thought, it, and it was only three years old. It yeah. was it was three year old bourbon. And we were absolutely blown away. We thought it was as good as anything else we had had. And, uh, and that was exciting. Um, so literally just, you know, okay, then we found a glass manufacturer. Then we found a cork, uh, you know, supplier. And we just put the whole thing together. Uh, and then we started chipping away at, uh, at, the, at the permits. Mm -hmm. And... So did and, you did you start at the experimental distillery then? Was that the had you bought a building no, or worked in no, the building? No, this was way yet? before that. Okay, this was way before that. Yeah. We did not we did not uh, go into the experimental distillery or begin that uh, sign a you know sign a lease on that building or begin that construction process until 2015. Really? Uh, okay. Um, or I guess you could say late. We so we we started distilling there at the end of March. It was March 27th of 2015. The only reason I know off the top of my head that it was March 27th yeah. is because we started distilling here at Riverfront March 27th of... Uh, <laughs> nice. <laughs> it was really fun. It's, it's, it's all weird, here, yeah, yeah. weird how it landed on the exact same day. Yeah. Um, but that was in 2017, of course, for Riverfront. So, so anyways, yeah, this is 2011 and um, we got everything packaged together. Um, we started interviewing uh, distributors and we started with Chattanooga of course and Athens Chattanooga was really excited about what we were doing and there were a couple of distributors in town that were not excited about <laughs> what we were doing they didn't think we would be anything mm. and to this day I still hear from time to time that uh, that they're pretty upset that they that they didn't get us you know? like, <laughs> that was your fault not our fault so Athens uh, Athens Tribune was our they were excited about it and we got our licensing and we got our first PO, and uh, and and then we we set up a launch party, and the launch party was in April of 2012. Uh, we had a Kickstarter campaign oh, that wow. we were trying to raise money to yeah. build a distillery, which uh, we barely got the money in our Kickstarter <laughs> campaign. It was it was ten thousand dollars, yeah, Ooh. Uh, which you could do nothing with in terms of building a distillery, yeah. Uh, we, our cork supplier couldn't get our corks to us in time. So we ended up putting wine corks in the bottles wow, okay. instead of, so these are collector's items. If anybody can find Well, them. that's the reason that we have a one piece cork, even though this is a custom cork now that's yeah. in our new packaging, yep. it was inspired by the wine cork oh, that wow. we were forced to use <laughs> because, uh, because we had set this launch party up. And so anyways, they, on we went and then. Then we got serious about the laws after that, yeah. after we launched Chattanooga Whiskey into the market. Okay. Yeah. And, and how was Chattanooga received at first? <clears throat> um, it was definitely a mixed bag. There were a lot of people that knew about our mission and wanted to be a part of it. There were a lot of people that just thought it was cool. And there was a, there was a pretty significant uh, hater crowd out there as well that said, this is Chattanooga. It's made in Indiana. These guys are just trying to capitalize on the name of the city, and they're not actually going to do anything. Mm -hmm. So we that's that's when that's when Joe and I got really aggressive in our communication around the fact that we don't make it, and uh, and even explicitly, you know, would would post that it's not made here we would get you know red markers and circle made in indiana on the back of the bottle and we would post it on facebook and yeah, yeah. at the time you know facebook was different there were thousands of followers chattanooga whiskey followers they were all engaged in what we were doing there was no algorithm that said that i mean everybody saw our posts 
So, you know, we would do something like that. And then, then the town would be talking about it. Yeah. And, uh, which was again, a, t- a timing thing it actually worked out for us really well to be doing all this on Facebook in, in 2011, 2012. So, um, yeah, so we would have a lot of people that would say like, eh, you know, I- I'm never going to drink it until they make it here. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and then we'd have some people that were supportive enough were supportive that when, we all met up at the courthouse in, uh, you know, in 20, um, uh, at the end of 2012, um, there was, uh, a huge, uh, sh- you know, showing of support yeah. and, and it, and it showed the County commissioners that, uh, this needs to be back. And I don't think that they would have, uh, voted for it to, to or, or shown their approval uh, if if that many people didn't show up in support, yeah. So so in the end, was it it was the state though that came through and yeah. opened it up for everybody, and that was the bill that you yep. second second bill. And this is where I say it's kind of like pulling back layers of an onion. Yeah. Uh, every time I hear this story, I get another piece of it that's kind of like, oh well, there's there's that's significant <laughs> and probably needs to be told as well. So House Bill 102, Senate Bill 129. Yeah, and it's actually got your name on it. Yeah. It's, uh, it is, it is the, um, I think it was a critical piece of Tennessee distilling history. And this opened it up for everybody. It opened the rest of the state up. Yeah. And I think that's where you've got a lot of your craft distillers that came from. Yeah. And there were, and there were some other major markets too, um, that couldn't distill up until that point. Mm. So. Very interesting. So in the early days, you're sourcing the, how have you seen the opinion over sourcing whiskey change from when you started to now? I thought there was going to be less appetite for outsourced whiskeys yeah. based on the appetite that I saw in the early days of Chattanooga whiskey. I'm actually very surprised to see how many successful NDPs there are right now and that back when we were sourcing from MGP, no one knew who it was. Now people are going after MGP, <laughs> even though they know that the brand doesn't make the product. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, quite surprised. It's a, I guess it's an education over time. I hear plenty of podcasters talk about it. I see people on Instagram talking about it. You hear about it on tours. Everybody's selling the fact. and. And legitimate, it's legitimate to say it's a 170 year old distillery. They know what they're doing. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, they're great. I mean, they make a great bourbon. Yeah. But it makes you, it makes you say, would it, would it be harder to start a distillery now with a sourced whiskey or back then? In other words, now you're going into a crowded market where a lot of people are using the same juice. Yeah. I would say um, it would be harder. Probably harder now because it's a crowded market, and really your your marketing and your your you know your communication and your network and you know, um, it has to be on point, yeah. right? There's a lot more aspects to to marketing that have to be on point, uh, sales and marketing have to be on point now, yeah, than back then because it is so much more crowded. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say, uh, I would say, yeah, now harder, but more except, I mean, you can, one thing you can kind of rest a little bit is, is that we're not going to meet the headwinds. We can probably do this for a really long time yeah. sourcing without having to build our own distillery because this, and this is where I get on my pedestal and I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand here on it, but like. To do it yourself is really hard. Yeah. And uh, in most, I would say, m- most people probably aren't prepared for what it's going to require financially um, as well as scientifically. It's, it's risky because you're putting something into a barrel you have to wait for. And if you don't do it right, then you have to wait a couple of years to find out your mistake, which that right. can yeah. be a that can be a big challenge. Absolutely, it's a huge risk. Yeah. So, it's how did you risk. mitigate that that risk? Then you you started experimenting. Is uh, this uh, 
Is this the way I understand yeah, it? Yeah, so um, I would say it was really helpful for us to start small, not big. And uh, when it was Joe and I trying to build this thing, we wanted to start big. And we didn't want to start small. Mm -hmm. And we kept on, uh, from, a, from a business perspective, from an operational perspective, we kept on running into walls preventing us from starting big. And it was the best thing that ever happened. Well, the best thing that ever happened to Chattanooga Whiskey as an organization mm -hmm. um, was that we were really forced to start small. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that allowed us to take risks from a product perspective that we wouldn't have otherwise taken. Yeah. So having a starting off on a hundred gallon Vendome pot still and three 100 gallon fermenters and a hundred gallon cooker, we could only produce uh, approximately one barrel, 153 gallon barrel of bourbon a week. Mm. And uh, meanwhile, we had enough MGP to be selling yeah. and, and to be generating revenue and, uh, and to be building a brand well enough to raise capital. And so we went through several, you know, capital rounds, um, which, you know, again, from a business perspective, I could go into, hmm. that'd be a pretty large, uh, you know, tangent. But so we, we felt more comfortable taking risks, but even when we were taking these risks, we didn't know what the product was going to taste like yeah. two, three years. And we were, we were basing everything off of white dog to begin with it, whether we liked it or not, yeah. you know, and um, and we had, there were in the very, very beginning, there was some white dog that was just like, this doesn't, this doesn't, this isn't appealing. And then you'd have, we'd have recipes where a white dog was really appealing. And then we, then we started building a tighter framework based off of that, mm -hmm. even though the framework we were building had very, you know, only had a little bit in common with a traditional bourbon like MGP. So did you, at what point did you decide, got to get a master distiller right off the beginning, or did you kind of do this experimentation yourself first? Man, this is, this is, this is going deep, deep. here. <laughs> um, we, uh, I was fortunate to find Grant and didn't know that, you know, Chattanooga Whiskey needed a master distiller when it was Joe and I. Yeah. Um, one of us was going to be the distiller. And then we, you know, we, we, as we hired some other people with marketing to help us with operations, somebody, you know, one of them kind of, kind of knew how to brew beer a little bit. So somebody was going to be the distiller. Yeah. And then, um, and then once Joe exited the company, uh, to me, I, I, I felt like we had to have somebody that knew what they were doing um, even on a smaller scale, uh, even, but I wanted it to be larger scale. Yeah. And, um, and I was introduced to Grant, uh, really because Larry Ebersold from, uh, from Lawrenceburg Distillers and MGP, the kind of the OG distiller yeah, yeah. of, uh, MGP, he was consulting with Joe and I and, and, um, and he started building or consulting on the, the construction of, new riff and he said hey you know come up here i want you to see this system because this is the system that you know you guys have been wanting to build yeah and that's when we were introduced to new riffs head distiller and that's when new riffs head distiller introduced us to grant who is still very, at his current brewery very nice so that's so, that's fascinating because uh as we were walking through because we did a little pre-tour through the distillery and um and Talking about, and I got a chance to taste uh, the um, the beer yep. itself. Yeah, and this is the very first time I've ever tasted a beer on either side of the Atlantic that I could have drank it the way it was. Such it, a huge compliment. It tasted yeah. so good, and I thought, yeah, I mean, I could see. What I loved is on the New Rift tour. They they say, you know, we thought the beer was important. And that's why we decided right. to get a brewer in making our beer before we convert it to, to whiskey. And yeah. I thought, I mean, that's so, it's like 30 distilleries in, in Chattanooga, Tennessee River, duh. You know, yeah. why would you not want to come up with a <laughs> brewer to right. come in and make your beer yeah. to make your whiskey? Yeah. 
So yeah, I mean that's uh, that's that's fascinating and and fun to see how that works. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> for when I when Grant and I we had a phone interview. We didn't, you know, he he ended up coming to Chattanooga and um, and our wives hung out and hit it off and uh, and they were at the beginning of uh, of starting their family as well and um and kind of you know we're the same age and he was really passionate about. Um, our history, our short history of changing laws, mm-hmm. and and you know was a certified distiller even though he was brewing every day, and was becoming more and more interested in that. And I think primarily because, um, you know, he really is a creative genius, and he saw that there was an opportunity to make a difference in the distilling industry, mm-hmm. and uh, and do it in Chattanooga, Tennessee, pretty cool town to do it in. Yeah. Um, with a company that has that started off with a pretty interesting history of changing <laughs> changing laws, and well, he had to see some commitment there for sure. Yeah, I mean, he uh, he did, and um, I think we just instantly trusted each other. And he was a very trustworthy. I could tell he's a very trustworthy person, and and he had a great track record. And um, and man, it's the best decision we ever made in the history of the company. And 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 even when he said he wanted to, you know, really explore high malt, when we had been all my 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 focus was generating revenue with MGP, you know, right. And so that was really uh, outside my, you know, I want I want to necessarily say my comfort zone, but uh, certainly outside my level of knowledge and. I just, I just said, like, I knew that this guy could do it. The so, guy knew he could do it. And, so, yeah. So was there a point where, because it's probably more recent that people have started shifting to American single malt instead of doing, so was there ever a, a question b- between, should we do a bourbon that's a high malt yep. or should we do yeah. a single malt? Yeah. 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 Actually uh, single malt crossed our minds. Um, malted bourbon crossed our minds. It's never been done before. We started malting corn, mm-hmm. uh, utilizing malted corn. Um, even our maltsters were like, uh, I don't know about this. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and it is, it actually is really challenging to malt corn and, mal- and malted corn does not have a, um, actually doesn't have a great flavor profile. So fortunately we didn't, chase that rabbit very far we yeah. started to it was extremely expensive it didn't seem sustainable mm-hmm. and so we stopped and we we backed up we were but we were going after that so then we created a new definition which was greater than 25 percent okay and uh and but with that we were able to explore a lot and we loved the white dog we were getting and then after you know it was in the barrel for three months six months nine months we really love that product as well. So yeah. we started really digging this uh, this um, thing, this direction we were going in, and then that's when we were like, well, it's not malted bourbon because it'd be like malted rye, which we have, which has to be greater than 51% right. in malt um, and malted rye, and, and this would have to really be greater than 51% in malted, you know, uh, in malted grains, which includes malted corn, which we didn't. Uh, want to pursue any further, even though we do have uh, actually um, some of that uh, in barrels, and it's not it's not bad. Um, it just isn't what we prefer. Um, so the twenty five percent plus thing uh, became it, and we coined it Tennessee High Malt, mm-hmm. and we trademarked it, and so that that became our like I said, you know, earlier about building the framework tighter and tighter. Yeah. Uh, that became our framework. That was the piece, and because yeah. no, I'm, I don't know anybody else that's really doing high malt even now, other than there's not a lot out there. Um, and I and and we we keep our blinders on pretty. I mean, Grant <laughs> Grant really keeps his blinders on. Do because, what you do and do it well. That's right, yeah. and that's and uh, and Grant and I are very much in lockstep on that. But Grant. Um, really believes that uh that he can continue to you know develop and create products that are unique to chattanooga whiskey without having to you know keep his eye and f- or finger on the pulse with everything else that's going on yeah whereas just being in my position as a founder and ceo i feel like i need to keep my finger on the pulse a little bit more yeah so I see some of what's out there but i will i think that uh in terms of exploring malts in bourbon, I don't think anybody's even come close to what Chattanooga whiskey has done. Mm. 
So I got a chance to taste the white dog off the still, and um, it was surprisingly complex. And I was getting caramel notes. I'm like, okay, that's uh, that's unique. It's coming before the barrel. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. And right. so, uh, and there's dark chocolate in there. It's yeah. a lot of stuff that I like in the 111. I was pulling yeah. that out of there. Yeah. So it's. It, it, it says a lot when you can take it off the still. And, I appreciate that. Yeah, and and there's um, there there I know that there are some people out there that uh, that don't put that much emphasis on the white dog. They don't they don't taste white dog and say, oh, you know, this is this is going to be a good bourbon. It's really almost like, well, we'll just see if it's a good bourbon or not. Yeah. And because of what we were forced to go through, we just don't look at it like that. I mean, we have tasting panels internally where we we taste, you know, different white dog batches against controls. Mm, okay. So we care very much about what the white dog tastes like. Yeah. 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 So you now have the experimental yep. and you got a, it's a hybrid pot still that you have over there. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, I mean, I, I, I just... For simplicity, I call it a pot still yeah. because compared to a column, right. it is it is a pot. Yeah, um, a batch system, one in one out. Um, but yeah, it has a column on top of it that has four plates. Right. Which just which just helps with the you know uh, controls and efficiency of the, of the pot still. In other words, you're not looking for heads and tails in that you are pulling from a specific range in the whiskey that you want to that is correct um but 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 we do of course you know uh we are mindful of heads and tails over there versus on a column yeah where i mean everything goes back it's 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 the heads and tails are like two percent yeah so that my question is you come up with something really great over on the smaller experimental still, <laughs> yeah, and then and, it changes. And then you have to bring it over to this large, yeah, and beautiful you, and you still. Can't, and you can't possibly make exactly the same thing. Yeah. yeah. What, I mean, what is the challenge with that? Is oh, it just it's, a... It's a challenge, but, but um, one that's worked out for us, um, the pot still creates, uh, you know, we call it, I mean, it's, it's complex, and grungy can have a negative connotation, so we wouldn't use that in our marketing. <laughs> but well, I guess if we're sitting here talking, and this will be utilized for marketing. It is. It is just grungy. It's got more going on. Yeah. Um. And the. See, we use complex. Yeah, that's yeah. Complex. It's, just, it's, it's a lot more complex. It sounds more beautiful than grungy. <laughs> right. I mean, but <laughs> but uh, but there's something about the rawness yeah. of that operation and that still that says that crafty. that is that's it's 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 super crafty yeah and um everything that we've scaled up has just become more approachable mm. so we take the things that we love over there yeah and then when we scale them up to the column and the pot over here everybody agrees that in terms of the general public's opinion it's going to be a lot better received yeah. than, than over at the experimental. Distillery. Although the experimental distillery has a cult following on our products that come out of there and the products are really good and they're, you know, they're getting older as well, which people like. Mm -hmm. um, but the recipes are quite different. The flavor profiles are quite different and really exploring bourbon and high malt bourbon on a 100 gallon pot still uh, if you want to explore it, it's, I think we do it first class and they're great tasting products, mm -hmm. but to the, to a much larger demographic and, and, uh, and consumer base, uh, in our fort, our dis distribution region of 14 States, what comes off of the column and the pot at Riverfront is going to be well received, uh, because it's going to take a bourbon enthusiast to really appreciate what's coming off of the pot. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. So over there you have um, a lot of experiments in your little Dunnage warehouse down mm -hmm. underneath. Yeah. The, bar the, old, the, the underground barrel cellar. Yeah. Yeah. What's the craziest thing that you've made that's, that's aging down there right now? Mm, man, I, I, I lose track because, uh, <laughs> it really, because we've, we've got over 350 experimental barrels that we've done. Wow. And... We've released 
now, I think between what we've released there and, and our, we scaled up more than a dozen recipes at Riverfront as well. So between the two locations, we've released now over 50 into the market. Wow. So uh, the tequila barrel finish, uh, you know, with, um, with significantly different high malts in it, uh, you know, honey malts, caramel malts, um, you know, just different roasted, toasted malts in there, um, was one of my favorite experiments. It was just, you know, it was XA tequila. Mm. It was a high quality tequila barrel. It had spent, I think, seven months in the barrel. Um, you would think, you know, pretty contrasting flavor profiles, but the way they work together was just dynamic, mm. really dynamic. Yeah. And, uh, and a lot of fun and almost felt like its own category, you know? Yeah. Um, cause I like to explore uh, with, you know, between scotches and Irish whiskeys as well. And, uh, and I was almost like, man, this could like be its own thing. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're still looking at that. And we've done a lot. Of, we've done some Isla finished stuff with, uh, with, you know, uh, Simpsons peated malt. Mm-hmm. Um, we, we utilize a decent amount of that for, for a, what we call a, a Scottish style, uh, bourbon and it, it's done, it's been really well received. It's done really well. And these different aisle, you know, aisle barrels have, uh, performed really well. And it's been fun to watch that, um, you know, apricot brandy, uh, barrel, um, you know, obviously the tawny port. I mean, we've done a lot of different things, so. I, I guess I, I just thought the tequila barrel was really cool. Yeah. And worked with our high malt recipe really, really well. Um, but, man, we did, I mean, our liqueurs, we did a Fig Amaro and a coffee liqueur. And they were both, I mean, you know, they, they were both fully aged high malt bourbons yeah. at, at the base of those things. And, um, of course, you know, Grant is really particular about his ingredients and there's nothing artificial about anything that we use. And they were so well received that uh, people demanded that we make more of it. And we just can't, we, you know, scaling that up <laughs> yeah. is hard because it's a high malt. It's our Tennessee high malt bourbon base. And we only, you know, in at Riverfront with between 91 and 111 are two flagships we're selling 100% of our capacity. So if we start producing, you know, uh, a you know some a liqueur line, it's got to be a bourbon base, and it's going <laughs> to eat into our 91 and 111 sales, and we just can't we just can't do it right now. So we're looking at all that. But anyways, I don't know. We've come out with a lot of really cool shit over there. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. The um, the experiment you have going on in the back, I think, is really interesting. We all have our own little infinity bottles at home. Yeah. And so you are working on an infinity cask. Yeah. It's yeah. an Oloroso cask, yeah. which I think is fascinating to just be... Yeah. It's an ongoing experiment. Well, it's going... So that is going over to experimental. Is it? Okay. Yes. Yep. Okay. So, um, so, and that's... Uh, we don't really have many details on that right now. So, yeah. that, I mean, we just got that cask in. And so <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Uh, I just, I just can't share much about it, but yeah, we're Grant and the team are always working on other ways to um, explore specialty malts and bourbon. And, and that includes uh, not just the malts themselves or the grains themselves, but that also includes utilizing different yeasts and uh, working with different barrel finishes and different toasts and chars. So, so, so a question about uh, finishing, because with Grant coming from a beer background, mm-hmm. to me, it seems the most natural fit to a whiskey, but I don't know very many people that do it. Finishing in a hoppy IPA beer barrel. <clears throat> yeah, so Chattanooga Whiskey has... Uh, it's on the it's on the bottom of that shelf right oh, there. Oh, okay. <clears throat> so that's called the Native Series. Yeah. Chattanooga Whiskey had what was called uh, so the Native Series was a um, was a beer barrel finished series, and it was really a community uh, collaboration mm-hmm. where we've got more than ten breweries in Chattanooga, and we would send them our barrels. They would age you know different styles of beer. And then we would get those casks back as soon as they dumped them to serve their beer. And then we would finish our bourbon mm. in it. And so, you know, beer barrel finished bourbon yeah. 
is not a popular thing. Um, there, we the first we did two seasons. The first season, it was eight breweries, one out of town, uh, one in Nashville. The second season was eight breweries, one out of Atlanta, uh, and seven here. And the first season was multiple different styles. Mm-hmm. The second season was strictly stouts. Okay. The, the second season was much more appealing than the first season. Okay. <clears throat> because they were all different. Uh, they were, they were all, all eight breweries did a different stout, mm. but the stout married really well, more consistently with our bourbon than the the lot the, than the different styles. Yeah, do. so like a Hefeweizen maybe, and a, mm-hmm. you know, and then a hoppy mm-hmm. IPA. Yep. And, yeah. Okay. And some of them, some of them hit. Some of them, uh, not, nothing was bad. Yeah. I'll say that from a bourbon perspective, they were all very interesting, and nothing was bad. Yeah. But I would say on the stouts, like most of them were really good. Yeah. But we came out with it at a fifty dollar price point. Or maybe even a sixty dollar price point, and your bourbon connoisseur or your bourbon, you know, consumer, yeah, they don't want a beer. <laughs> they don't want a beer barrel bourbon, right? At fifty bucks, yeah. Uh, so you know, uh, fortunately, we didn't make a lot of it, um, but it was cool for the community. The people that were the pe- the 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 people that are really into beer, especially locally, loved it. Yeah. And, uh, and I won't say that we won't ever do it again. We might actually bring that back. And I would say that we were definitely on the forefront of beer barrel bourbon for mm-hmm. sure. We've got that on our resume. Yeah. But, um, when to revisit it, when to revisit it is, yeah. the, is a question. Yeah. So you were yeah. telling me earlier, and I think this is, this is a great story because it shows that there are risks even after you've established yourself. And so the shift from 1816, your sourced flagship at that point, yeah. to making Chattanooga whiskey 91 and 111. Yeah, eight years. Yeah, so how did that happen? <clears throat> well, we had already committed to barrel number 91 being the recipe that we wanted to scale up as our flagship that created both 91 and 111. Mm -hmm. So we committed to that, uh, in 2017 when we commissioned our still Mm. and, um, the reason that we chose that recipe was because it was a 75, 25 split. 75% 75% non-GMO yellow corn, 25% made up of three other specialty malts, caramel malted barley, honey malted barley, and, uh, and malted rye. The MGP recipe was 75% corn, mm-hmm. uh, but it had 21% rye in it. Of course, the rye was not malted. Right. It was a raw rye. Yeah. But... Uh, even a smaller percentage of malted rye is going to stand out uh, compared to a to a larger percentage of raw rye. Yeah. So we were definitely inspired by this recipe to a degree. Even though we did we did a lot crazier stuff than that, we were like, all right, we need really a a balanced approach here it, within our our world of Tennessee high malt because uh, we don't want to send our consumers that we've been working on for all these years packing yeah because it because we alienated them with something that was polarizing compared to 1816 right so i want i don't want to say that we just denied our roots we very much cared about the bourbon that we had been selling and wanted to move from there that said it was different, mm-hmm. a lot different. Yeah. You know, it's not like just going from a still in Indiana to a still in Chattanooga. You're right. Is it, which would be different as well. Yeah. But this was way, way different than that. But it was, it was what we wanted out of a bourbon. What we wanted out of a bourbon was dark notes of dark chocolate and this roasted toasted profile, this s'more profile, you know, chocolate covered cherry profile, a little bit of, 
you know, red fruit in there, or maybe even a little bit of apricot in there. Like that's what we were after. We were after deeper, darker, richer, more complex. Like that's what we wanted. Yeah. And we felt like 91 was the best representation of that while still being a straight bourbon whiskey. Okay. And so, yes, it was a huge risk. It was a, it was very calculated. Because you just shut off 1816. And that was the risk, right? And, yeah. and but it, it was a, such a different product. We were like, we cannot put this in <laughs> the 1816 bottle, yeah. right? It has to be its own thing. Not to mention so many people we had been fought for so long. It's not made here. It's not made here. It's not made here. We're like, you know what? We're going to emboss this bottle and we are going to put made in Chattanooga, Tennessee <laughs> as, as you know, so you can see it from a mile away. Yeah. So, um, yeah, where I, where I'd say, I just don't know of anyone else that has done it. Like we have, or taken this, this type of risk, like we have is, we were outsourcing, we were an NDP. We built up a multi thousand case brand over a, an eight year period and we completely ripped the bandaid off. We hit the stop button yeah. on that product um, in 2019. And when we felt like 91 and 111 were ready to hit the shelves, which was early because uh, it was a younger product, comparatively speaking, yeah. which I can talk about that as well. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. We, th we tasted it and we said, it's ready. This is ready. Yeah. And, we uh and we you know stopped 1816 and started 91 on 111 and that was in august of 2019 and um i think chattanooga whiskey would not be anywhere close to where we are today if we hadn't done that but yeah was it scary yes, yes yeah. and if i had i think i told you that if i had uh some uh, investors or board members that were you know, had, that had significant spirits uh, experience or branding experience standing over my shoulder, yeah. watching every move that I made, I don't think it would have ever happened. It would have shut it down. I yeah. think it would have been shut down. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yay for the uh, small craft distiller uh, having a voice. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I'm really proud of uh, the risk that we've taken. I think it's become... A huge part of our story people you know when we're when we're giving if, if we're you know giving tours and or if i'm if i'm giving a tour like you know with you today um you know there's there's a lot of different elements there's the uh there's really you can almost look at it in like two year increments mm -hmm. right i mean there's the uh the changing of the laws and then there's the there's the uh building the experimental distillery and then there's the coming out with what came out of the experimental distillery and then there's the building of the riverfront distillery and then there's coming out with what came out of the riverfront distillery right well, one step at a time but you, you get a little caught up and yeah. then you move on to the next step absolutely but but when i look at those phases yeah and i look at that history the 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 law changing is a cool part of who we are but it isn't the whole story it's not even not even just the whole story, but for me, it's not the thing that I'm most proud of. Yeah. The thing that I'm most proud of is the risk that we took on Tennessee High Malt and the ripping of the Band-Aid off of a product that mm. is now so, that people are so fond of. Yeah. But that I would say that, you know, especially for our team, um, not only do we enjoy 91 and 111 or this Tennessee High Malt flavor profile so much more than we enjoyed our MGP profile, Consumers are really catching on to it, and consumers are really enjoying it too. And uh, in flavor profile and, and palettes are shifting, yeah, and evolving, just like they did in the beer industry mm -hmm. to, towards IPAs. It's interesting to see how they are kind of following the same mm -hmm. same path. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and now here we are. We've been working on it. See, ten years feels like a lifetime. <laughs> I bet. Uh, it's my entire. Th I just turned forty, so from thirty to there forty. You go. Uh, so a whole it's decade of uh, a whole decade of my life. But so let's talk about the uh, before we get to what the next step is, because there's stuff coming. Um, let's talk about the ninety-one and one eleven, because right now we're tasting something that you pulled out of the Solera. This is the first time I've seen a Solera yep. up, yep. up, up close and personal. Yeah, right. Basically a huge, is it Cypress? So, uh, no, that is actually white oak. It is white oak, okay. Yeah, so okay. that is a 4,000 gallon white oak 
Solera barrel. And it has a char on the inside of it too. Does it? Okay. Yeah. And do you have to rechar it? We do not. No. Okay. The, the plan is for that to be a forever barrel. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And so we're tasting, this was what, 118? Uh, approximately proof. 118 proof. Of, yep. of the 91? Of the 91 recipe. Recipe. Yep. Yeah. So again, four grain, three specialty malt. And it's recipe. amazing to me how different 91 and 111 are. are. Yeah. And one of the things that hit me immediately after realizing how much I like the flavor characteristic of the 111 is also that uh, if you buy a bottle of Old Granddad 114, you know you're drinking 114 proof whiskey. That will you know yeah. burn through your tongue if you hold yep. it for too long. The 111 does not do that. It's nice on the palate, even though it's a high high proof yep. it's still very drinkable what do you attribute that to so for me <clears throat> i uh i attribute to every step of the process i i don't think you can skip steps but i'm particularly proud of our fermentation process and i do think that at a long cold fermentation um it it, it really helps ground the recipe uh and, and celebrate the recipe whereas in a short hot fermentation uh the yeast is a lot more present and i think can you know it can be a contributing factor to uh, a, a more ethanol forward product mm -hmm. um also uh distillation proof you know coming off the still significantly lower than the average uh distiller um, I think that also is a, is a contributing factor. And then, and then, you know, not just aging in a four-char barrel, but aging in a four-char barrel and a three-char barrel with a toast. I think yeah. the toast has a huge impact on that as well. Those confectionery flavor elements, mm -hmm. I think, really kind of help round it out. Um, and then finally, the Solera barrel, you know, he's at, as probably a touch of fruit. Yeah. And, uh, and, and once again, you know, just helps uh, round it out. So whose idea was the Solera barrel? And where was the knowledge about Solera barrels before that? 100% Grant's. Is it? Idea. Okay. And, and, he's, and, if, and he has a lot of uh, um, knowledge of, you know, Fodor, uh, you know, vessels. And, um, and in Grant, when it comes to... <clears throat> exploring for the sake of uh, of complexity to him uh, you know the every step of the process there's an opportunity to do something else or go the extra mile before it hits that bottling line mm -hmm. and that's where the Solera was you know Come, comes came, yeah it came from yeah so this is amazing and uh, thanks yeah, I'm just it, we love it it's I, what's also Especially fun is it's not available on the market. Exactly. So <laughs> yeah. Well, it's because yeah. uh, it's got a, it's got a little herbaliness to it. I almost could pick up like a, uh, almost like a black tea uh -huh. on it. Yeah. Uh, but I also it's the longer it's sat in this glass, the more the it's the caramel up. smell is mm -hmm. really thickened up. Yeah. And um, and this is the one that when proofed down, yeah, really starts to go more towards the apricot and yeah, stone correct. fruit kind of yep. uh, of a direction. So correct. That's yeah. why I, I keep sniffing this glass because I'm like, yeah, I could keep my nose in this one for a while. <clears throat> that's a great flavor profile. We we love it. And again, yeah, it's what makes 91 and 111. But 111 does not get the Solera barrel. 90 only 91 does. But again, that that Solera barrel is a. 50-50 blend of four chars and three chars with a toast, which mm. is a pretty big deal. So next step is you have some new product coming out beyond 91. There's a rye now. Yep. So we have 99 rye was released in 2020 and I uh, got uh, Whiskey Advocate Top 20, uh, which was uh, for 2020, which was really cool. And then, but it's, it's pretty limited and we make it all year, but we just don't make a lot of it. So it sells out pretty fast, kind of hard to, to come by. And what's the significance of the 99 and the rye? That's uh, We felt like it was a, so rye is spicy, and we felt like 99 was a, uh, a proof that would provide a lot of texture without being, you know, overkill. And from a, marketing, from a marketability perspective, lands between 91 and 111. Okay. So, and and yeah. is, it, is it a rye malt? Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it is greater. So it's about it's greater than sixty percent malted rye that's in there. Okay. Yep. Wow. So uh, so I don't know. We're kind of 
kind of OG a little on uh, on malted uh, rise. I think I don't know who the the first one would have been. I was gonna say well, I know uh, 291 Distillery in Colorado does it, and I think Frey Ranch does it because they malt everything. They've gotten to a point where they just he's got his own farm. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So um, our our the 99 rye was inspired by batch 007 out of the experimental distillery. Okay. So so we started distilling uh, malted rise in uh, in 2015. So it's too bad that you couldn't call it the James Bond rye since it's 007. I know, it's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to remember that now because oh, I, I love rye. Yeah, and I'll yeah. be like, there, that's that 007 rye. Had a hint of uh, purple on the label. Yeah. I don't know if I can't remember if James Bond ever wore any purple. I don't think he did. But. <sighs> Maybe in the Roger Moore years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Um, so, and you're doing finishing? Yeah. Yeah, we've got, so, all right. So 90, 91, 111. 99 rye and then we introduced barrel finishing series this year Mm -hmm. and our first barrel finishing was a tawny port uh that was um that had a a custom blend of six different high malt uh recipes Mm. in it so it was really complex yeah and um and those tawny port barrels came from the duro valley they were they were awesome barrels and then, so each year we will have a new barrel, you know, different uh, finishing barrel yeah. for the barrel finishing series. So, and it'll probably be a different recipe, you know, each time. So that's pretty cool. And then, um, so that'll, but barrel finishing series will always be around moving forward to complement 91, 111, and 99 rye. And uh, we've got some single barrels that we do. We just don't do a lot of them. And then finally, uh, we released Bottled and Bond. We, we do two vintages per year. We have a spring vintage and a fall vintage each year. Those recipes change a little bit as well, mm. and uh, and so the first release came out in June, and uh, was a blend of four different recipes, um, and then now we are coming out with our fall vintage, mm-hmm. which again is a which uh, is is a blend of four different recipes, and in those recipes. There is a uh, malted wheat bourbon that is in there a mal- with utilizing several different uh, malted wheats. Mm-hmm. And then also um, what we call a Scottish style that uh, has some smoked grains in there, including uh, Simpson's peated malt as well. So Man. maybe the only bottom bond in America with a, uh, a touch of peat. That with, a tu- with a touch of peat. Yeah. Um, on the spring vintage, I think that you picked up the smoke more than the fall vintage. I think the fall vintage is probably going to be a little more appealing to your average bourbon consumer compared to spring yeah uh but spring it's sold out it's hard, and I, I, I think it's nearly impossible to get now so it did well but um but we're really excited about uh about this one well we were talking about uh transparency of you in the beginning <clears throat> stating clearly that your whiskey was made in indiana yeah but the thing that i think sticks out to me on your bottles now is how transparent on the 91 and 111 you are about every single step of what you're doing yeah. with that whiskey. We don't have anything to hide. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's fun. So we're actually have a glass of the bottled in bond fall yep. edition right This is right the here. yeah. This is the fall edition. This is before it before it hits the uh, market. So it's good. There's a lot going on in, in these things. Yeah. But hey, cheers. Cheers. Thanks for having me on the show. Oh, well, thank you for taking the time and talking about I love getting the full history, as you can tell. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I, I think as I, as I get a little older, I know I'll become a little more of a history buff. Uh, mm. But I think over the last 10 years, my head has been so buried in building Chattanooga whiskey. Uh, it's just really about putting one foot in front of the other. And I don't take enough time to look back and and think about what we've accomplished. But I will say that our team is second to none. Our distillers are second to none. Um, you know, our packaging was all created by Rich Abercrombie, our creative director over the last, you know, again, or who I play music with, who said, I can't believe you posted that on Facebook. <laughs> and, uh, and he's sitting in there now. And, um, you know, we do everything in-house. And we take a lot of pride in it. I think we've done a lot of cool things. I think it's uh, Napoleon Hill that was quoting someone saying, you must burn your bridge behind you. And that's the only way to motivate yourself to move forward. And so you did it twice. 
because yeah. you put a statement out there that basically said, here's what we're doing before even, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. And then you dumped a product that was an eight year seller for yeah. you and yeah. there's another bridge you burned <laughs> to, to get there. So you're living proof that that does work. That's, that's interesting. Yeah. I, I love that. Fun, fun. So, so, you know, it's funny is I'm sitting here sipping that. You're right. It's very complex. This is one of those that probably the longer I sit with it, I can pull out some of the traditional smells out of it. Um, Touch of honey. Yeah. The grain comes through on this one. Yep. Um, and is that, I wonder if that's uh, um, the wheat. Maybe? Yeah. No, yeah. I mean, well, you know, wheat's a softer grain, but uh, when you malt it, it's... Um, it's quite butterscotchy. Yeah, and I got a little, uh, I got a little cherry in there too, and sort of a mm -hmm. there's like a wine characteristic to that. I it's funny know. that you say that because um, we got that feedback on our on our spring vintage a yeah. lot. Yeah, a lot of people said that it had a wine characteristic. Yeah, I still get it in there. I mean, it's still a whiskey. You can uh, it, it has the whiskey characteristic stand out the most, but. Uh, yeah, and you get uh, you get the the oak comes through on there as well, but it's it's not musty oak. It's but it's, it's not really even a, a, a sawdust kind of a of a right. smell. It's it's somewhere in between. You know, it's there. It's nutty, and uh, you if you inhale a little too too quickly, the uh, the alcohol tickles your nose, but yeah, you don't yeah. really smell the. Uh, no, it's not not very ethanol forward. Yeah, yeah, very nice. Excellent. Well, thank you so much yeah, for of course, man. again spending so much time and the tour of the distillery was fun to see. I've been to the one downtown now, seen the experimental, heard some of the stories. I think that's where I heard the story about the coffin uh, and, Probably. and storing whiskey. Yeah. yeah. So pick up these little stories and then I'm like, where did I hear that? I know somebody <laughs> told me that story. We're not, we're not doing that any longer. Yeah. We never did that. <laughs> Although kind of a kind of cool kind of a cool concept well maybe one of these days because it's funny i i did research on a town called new hope in kentucky that had 10 distilleries pre-prohibition a town that nobody would think yeah. if you drove through it today because it's mostly a ghost town yeah looking but yeah, yeah i mean railroad went through there 10 distilleries got the names of all of them that's cool so you've got that now for chattanooga yeah now you it's finding how they tie into the rest of Tennessee whiskey. Right. Yeah. 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 More than 30 distilleries and less than 30,000 people. So that's, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Well, it's location, location, location. <laughs> <laughs> this town is, uh, is, is becoming a, a really uh, hot town for people to move to and visit as they're discovering the importance of the outdoors. Yeah. And Chattanooga has got it, you know, right in the middle of, of uh, the, some of the best rock climbing, uh, rafting. Fish. Rock rock City. Yeah, Rock City. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> Since exactly. I was a kid, Rock yeah. City every time yeah, you Rock City through. and the Choo Choo. Those yeah. were your two yeah. major destinations back in the day. But now, I mean, now you got people moving here from all over to, to rock climb and, uh, and to paddle and to fish um, it's, it's, and to mountain bike. It's pretty amazing. This yeah. is an amazing little uh, community. And... It's growing like crazy. I think we're about to. I think I read somewhere we're about to pass Knoxville. Is really uh, Knoxville's population? Yeah. Okay. So, You're gonna have to get more than one freeway through the middle of town. That, that, <laughs> don't even get me started on that. I can't, I can't. You can't get out. You can't get in. That's gonna. Be, you know, not, maybe not a bad thing. Yeah, it's Hotel people, California. That, <laughs> maybe a lot of people will. Uh, will just be like, you know what? Like, we tourism is really important for us and our business. So I definitely want people coming here. But no, yeah. the, the freeways right now do not make it easy. Yeah. Well, hopefully, maybe someday. I don't out. know. We're locked between a mountain and a river. It's pretty. It's a pretty narrow passage. Yeah. So. Well, with millennials that, that wanting to not drive as much, maybe the train will come through here, and we'll we'll have a true Chattanooga choo choo. Uh, we have so many covered up train tracks under these uh, un, under under these roads. Yeah. It's. Uh, I mean, even through my neighborhood that I, where I live downtown, it's really um, it's, it's kind of sad. I'd, I'd love to see it come back. Yeah. Be fun to see old pictures of that, yeah, and and how it was down here, yeah, awesome. Well, again, thank you very much. Just yeah. sampling some really great whiskey oh, and awesome. and great conversation. Yeah, thanks, Drew. Appreciate it, man. It's been a delight. Uh, 
Anytime, come down, hang out, and we'll get into some other experiments that we have. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, man. If you want to learn more about Chattanooga whiskey, just head to chattanoogawhiskey.com. Check out my tasting notes for this bottle of Bottled in Bond, along with show notes, social media links, books, swag, and all things whiskey lore at whiskey-lore.com. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure you're subscribed and tell a friend about the show. I'm your host, Drew Hanish. Have a great week, and until next time, cheers and slan java. Whiskey Lore is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC.